Let's everybody give it up for everybody watching right now. Obviously, Tennessee, but um, Pastor Mike just sent me everybody watching. We got hundreds of people watching right now from Colorado, Florida, Oklahoma, Nevada, Illinois, Georgia, California, Iowa, Indiana, Maine, North Carolina, of course, and Minnesota. That's probably Matt's family. What's up, everybody? I can't believe nobody noticed. It's a miracle. <laughs> okay, last week, if you weren't with us, I tattooed on my knuckles, hold fast. It's a Norwegian nautical term. This is where we're getting this series idea from. And I've got my rope here. It's, it's what they would do, sailors would do to show their commitment to the fellow sailors that they would say, listen, no matter the storms, no matter what comes in life, I'm not going to let go of the line. I'm going to hold fast. What a great angle. And so I, I tattooed my knuckles last week. How many people thought they were real? Let's take a poll. Some of you are like, well, Brent, man, I know Brent. I'm sure he probably did that. How many thought, knew they were fake? Raise your hands. Um, somebody, I, I, I tried to get, there's a, a form of, is it a, the Hanna tattoos? Is it Hanna that's supposed to last like six weeks? But Rhonda's like, Brent, that's not going to work really well. So she did something very uh, exper experimental. It's, it's a new form of tattoo called Sharpie. It's a <laughs> Sharpie tattoo. And a lot of people got it that I didn't do it. So I felt kind of bad. So I said, Rhonda, go ahead and schedule me um, because I didn't really want anything on my hands because it seemed to hurt. So I went ahead and scheduled um, a tattoo <laughs> setting this week. And so I went ahead and... And some of you are like, well, these tattoos really don't hurt at all. <laughs> so I, I just did this for fun, but I, I got on Amazon because is anybody like me? You like just order stuff on Amazon just to do it. You know, it's like Amazon's like the new form of the home shopping network. And so I was thinking of tattoos and I went and got a 12 pack of tattoo sleeves for $5. And these were out of the 12, these were the only two that were somewhat clean, except for the girl right here in the bikini. But other than that, um, I guess I'll wear them for stockings for Halloween. That will be great. Um, hold fast is not ta tattooed to my knuckles, but it is tattooed on my heart. Uh, I love this series. I love this angle. And I'm asking us to really tattoo our faith, to be inspired, to be challenged, to be convicted. Because a lot of us today... Whatever's not nailed down when it comes to faith is being ripped up, washed downstream, and the church is even in that. We live in tough days, and so I want to continue to talk about that. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Daniel chapter 3. We're going to look at pretty much the entire chapter. I love this moment in God's Word. I'm not going to call it a Bible story, but it's an Old Testament moment that really speaks louder than ever to all of us, and we can relate. Remember, God's Word. This is my epic Bible, and I, I preached it when we went to Israel. God's word is more than a story. It's about a real place where real people came for a real purpose. Okay, and so today here, here in, in the building, some of y'all, do you like your Delta One seats? I mean, we have really spread the seats out. Some of you are like, the leg room is, who likes the leg room? Amazing. So I want to take you to Israel. So these seats are Delta One. If you've ever flown international, Delta One seats to get that much leg room to fly all the way to Israel is about $3,000. So what we're going to do now in lieu of that in tithing today, for those of you in the center sections... <laughs> We're going half off, $1,500. That's, that's good. That's good. We're going to get to that in a minute, but we're going to merge all this together because some really good things have kind of transpired in my mind. Tough days. It's been a tough week. It's tough several days. Have you had a tough day this week? Raise your hand. Have you ever wondered some, sometimes, is it too tough for God? I did this week. Um, I'll start with this story. I like this story a lot. It's an interesting story. A man was walking down the beach in California. And it's during the pandemic, and I would not want to live in California. We've had people watching from California today, and I'm like, y'all need to move to East Tennessee because this is God's country. You remember when we used to have pay phones, and you would put a quarter in for a local call? Well, I mean, if you live in East Tennessee, it's God, calling God's local. It's, you know, California is really long distance. It's a lot of money. So this man was walking down the beach, and he was praying to God, like we all have been lately. Many of us are, God, what's going on in this crazy world? And he asked a great question. He goes, God, if it's okay, 
And we're going to talk about that even this week in prayer with supplication, re- bringing your request to God. He goes, God, if it's okay, would you grant me one request? To which his surprise, and it reminded me of the skit last week, the clouds parted and a booming voice came from heaven and said, because you've tried to be faithful to me, yes, I will grant you one request. The man was taken back, and all of a sudden, the only thing he could think of was his happy place. And he goes, God, could you build me a bridge to Hawaii? I mean, I'm in California. Could you build a bridge? I can't get there right now. They've closed it down. But anytime I get blue, I could get in my car or my motorcycle, and I could take the bridge to Hawaii. God's like, listen, that's not a a great realistic request. Can you imagine the concrete it would take to form a support to hold up a bridge to the bottom of the Pacific Ocean to Hawaii. That's super materialistic. Why don't you do this? Why don't you back up just for a minute and think of another request that would honor and glorify me, God said. To which the man thought about it for a minute. He goes, okay, I'll switch gears. God, I really want to know how women think. I want to know why they cry so much. I want to know why a woman woman would say nothing what she's really meaning inside. I want to know the heart of a woman. To which God kind of paused and he goes, how many lanes do you want on that bridge? Two or four? (laughs) Oh! Oh, he's not there. He's not there. Um, you're like, Brent, what is, have you ever thought, I mean, sometimes things are even too tough for God. I had a, I've had a tough week. We've had tough weeks. Um, I've talked to teachers this week. It's been tough to navigate this. I mean, it's been a, t- you know, it's a tough day when you wake up and the birds outside your window are buzzards, you know, like what is <laughs> this week, Monday and Tuesday was so hard for me. I woke up to discover Tuesday that my waterbed broke only to think I don't have a waterbed. I mean, that's how. <laughs> Come on, y'all, add to your seats. Add to your seats. Some of you, your birthday, you get so old, it's a tough day, your birthday cake collapses under the weight of its own candles. Your horn gets stuck right there at a red light in front of a biker gang. You know what I'm saying? I'm literally trying, y'all. I am trying hard, trying hard. All right, so Marty, Tom Petty, I won't back down, 1987. Let's go back to 1987. Oh, my Lord, I want to go back to 1987. My son's in the room. He's 17. I was 17 in 1987. What a great year. But some of you don't know the backstory to this very iconic song. Tom Petty in 1987 was having dinner with his first wife, I believe, his five-year-old daughter and their housekeeper was in the house when somebody came by that didn't like Tom Petty and burned his house down while he was in it. His house burned to the ground. An arsonist came to try to kill he and his family while they were eating dinner. Tom Petty, his housekeeper, went outside. They battled the flames, got the family out, tried to douse the house with a garden hose. Tom would say his garden hose melted in his hands. His housekeeper sustained burns. He lost his entire house and everything in 1987. So two years later, in his, uh, on his album, Full Moon River, I'm looking to you, Dave, because you're my fellow rocker, Full Moon River, um, a song came out, I Won't Back Down, and it really became iconic. You know how crazy powerful music is? Y'all know that, right? I mean, Marty absolutely slayed that. Does he not sound like a mix of Bob Dylan and Joe Walsh? I mean, come on. I was researching this song, and a man... He sat next to his wife in a hospital room while she had a coma for days and days and days and played her music and talked to her and whispered sweet nothings in her ear because he loved her so much. And he played the song, I Won't Back Down, by Tom Petty as she came out of her coma in the middle of that song. That's crazy. It's become an anthem. So here's the deal. Tom Petty was driving back and forth from a a, a rented apartment, lost everything, They were staying in hotels. He was a musician, a lyricist, writing songs. And he was so traumatized by this arson moment in his life. He was so traumatized by the fire and the flames 
that he wrote a song, and he, he didn't even want the word fire in the song. So you can hear the lyric in the gates of hell. And why did he write it? He said, you know what? I wrote this song. The lyrics just came to me to reclaim my life. I was so traumatized by this moment that somebody would actually want to kill me. I had enough money. I could have just moved to the hills of Montana. But he said this, and everybody look at me. He said, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to back down from my one and only life. I'm going to reclaim my life, and I'm going to live it, and I'm not going to back down. And he said, when he wrote it, it became therapy for him. And every time he sang it, it just reclaimed his life once more. I think this is the perfect song for people of faith today. The perfect song to say, well, hold fast, and we won't back down. So let's rewind. Let's go back a long time. Let's go back to 605 BC. That's not before COVID. That's before the birth of Christ. Let's go back to a time where a nation had it way worse than we did. Jerusalem was going to be under siege and was going to fall and was going to be held captive by the country of Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar would invade Jerusalem and he would win. God's people, the Hebrews, would be enslaved. Yes, some of them would go in chains and to build great structures in Babylon, but Nebuchadnezzar was pretty smart. He also took the brightest and the best among the people in Jerusalem, and he incorporated them into their society. He used their wisdom and their integrity to see his kingdom flourish. Here we have Daniel, the story of Daniel. But we also have three young men, probably in their early 20s by now, that I've not preached on, that I've seen. I, I looked through all my message notes in the last 15 years. I don't remember the last time I preached on three young men. Their names were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Who's ever heard of those three young men? They're famous in God's word. Uh, it's more than a story. It's about a real couple of young men who are going to hold their ground, and their theme song is going to be, What? I Won't Back Down, even though they're going to face the fire. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if you read about it, they tolerated a lot. They were captive from Israel to Babylon. Their real names were not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That, that was not their Hebrew names. Those were their Babylonian names. They had to tolerate a new culture that did not worship the one true God. They tolerated a lot. Guess what? We today have to tolerate a lot as Christians in America. Moral dissent is spiraling out of control. There's poop in the brownie everywhere. Some of you are like, what? <laughs> Don't worry about it. We tolerate a society today that wants to do away with the nuclear family, God's blueprint for marriage. Listen, we live in a world which is great. We live in a world of freedom in our society, although who knows how long we'll have it, where you can say and worship as you please. That's great. The land of the free. So with that, we tolerate a lot. Here's what I'm asking you and asking me today. Some things, we got to draw a line in the sand, and we cannot tolerate anymore. We have to hold fast to our faith, and we have to sing, I won't back down with our lifestyles. What's it going to be? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God's word is absolutely amazing. If you can just get past their crazy names, I grew up. My dad taught me how to say it when I was a little boy because his dad taught him how to say it when he was a little boy. I couldn't pronounce Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, so dad taught me, shake the bed, make the bed, and the bed will go. That's how I learned <laughs> that story. I did. So in Daniel chapter 3, if you have your Bibles, we're going to look at most of this chapter. I got a lot to say and a little time to say, a little time to say it. It's interesting that we sometimes think, man, things are too tough for God. Why are you so distant? What is going on? I thought I was a Christian. I thought I didn't have to go through fire. I thought that's what the perk of Christianity was, that you were going to watch me. I mean, that's why people say, I'm going to hang with Pastor Brent, because he won't get COVID. The Bible says, listen, we all go through fires. God will be with us if we will grasp his hand. 
So let's set the stage. 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar captures Jerusalem. He takes everyone back, the brightest and best, puts Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know what, um, into really plush positions. He liked them. They began to rise in the ranks of the Babylonian Empire. They flourished even as captives because they had integrity and they were smart. They became wealthy. Well, here's the story. If you don't know it, let's look at it in the entire chapter. Nebuchadnezzar goes on an ego trip. Has anybody ever gone on an ego trip before? Anybody next to you gone on an ego trip before? So Nebuchadnezzar is weird to say, right? Nebuchadnezzar. So let's bring it to 2020. We'll call him King Neb Daddy for our purposes, okay? King Neb Daddy. I think it works. It works. King Neb Daddy goes on an ego trip. Why do we know? How do we know that? Listen to verse 1. This is what he does. Check this out. We've been talking in our society today about monuments and statues. Listen. Nebuchadnezzar, King Neb Daddy, made an image of gold. 90 feet high and 90 feet wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the providence of Babylon. How about that? Anybody you think would pull that statue down today if it was 90 feet high made of gold? I think people would. They wouldn't even know who he is or what he stood for, but it was gold. So we're pulling that thing down. Nebuchadnezzar is such an egomaniac He builds a statue of himself 90 feet. Why would you build it 90 feet wide? I mean, I want the slim mode if I'm going that tall. (laughs) So for me, you know what? I'm modest. It's conservative time. So next week when you see the 12-foot statue of me in the lobby (laughs) with the blue... No, I mean, it's... This is how insane it, when you think of our society, this is how insane it is. When you think of our leadership and everything happening, King Nebdaddy builds a 90 foot tall statue of himself. It's interesting what happens in verse four. Here's what he tells the people around him. Then the herald loudly proclaims. So Nebuchadnezzar's um, spokesperson says this, and listen to what it says in the Bible. Nations and peoples of every language. This is what you are commanded to do. Not a suggestion. As soon as you hear the music, everybody, when you hear music, turn to the statue, fall down, worship the image of gold that Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. This is not the captives of just in Jerusalem. This is everybody. This is all of us. So you think how awesome God's word is? You have three young men in a foreign culture dealing with a big-time political correct issue here. What do you do? Dealing with all kinds of peer pressure. What do you do? And basically, they're flourishing. And so they're basically asked to compromise just a moment. I mean, I'm sure the herald goes, now listen, the song is only going to last a couple of minutes. We're basically going to play I Won't Back Down by Tom Petty. And you bow down. And then after that, you go about your business. But everybody's going to do it to show how loyal they are and how they worship, really, King Nebdaddy. As their president, their king, their god, little G. Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are going to go, I'm going to draw a line in the sand. Skip down to verse 12. It's interesting. You know there was jealousy happening. People that grew up in Babylon, that these Hebrew hicks had taken their positions... These flamethrowers, you see these people on Facebook today. They like to throw flames. What do they say in verse 12? Hey, uh, King Nebdaddy, there are some Jews whom you've set over the affairs of the providence of Babylon. You know I'm talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They pay no attention to you. They don't serve your gods. They don't worship the image of gold that you set up. Verse 13, we know King Nebuchadnezzar loves these three. He trained them. They were his boys. He liked them. There was something about them, and I really think they stood out because of their integrity and their faith. But Nebuchadnezzar now begins to kind of listen to everybody around him, and his ego gets to be to a place that just absolutely goes off the deep end. Verse 13, furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to him, Is it true that you don't worship my gods or worship the image of gold that I have set up? 
And this is what he says. He gives them one, one more chance. Not everybody gets a second chance. He goes, now, when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, all the kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, what does the Bible say? Very good. But if you don't worship, I will throw you immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Verse 16, 17, and 18, everybody look at me. Beyond a sermon, we all need to hear it. This is a hold fast moment that the church, people of God need to understand. Listen to what these young men said in a very difficult moment. They're in the fire. It's a tougher than tough day. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, by the way, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into a blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from even you. But whew, even if God does not, we want you to know right here and right now that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Can't you hear it? But I... Won't that? I mean, you can hear it. You can hear it. They had conviction. They had confidence. You know what you can do in your life with conviction and confidence? It's unbelievable that they would say, you know what? We are so entrenched and we are so going to hold fast to our faith. I don't care what happens. They had faith. Everybody has faith. You're like, no, I don't. Brent, you seem like you're a person of faith, but I don't really have. Yeah, you do. We're all going to put our faith in something. Atheists put their faith in themselves. Today, we've put in faith in science. We put our faith in Dr. Fauci. We put our faith in trees. We put our faith in everything. The object of your faith matters the most. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego put their, their faith in the one true God and write it down. Everybody, ready? They didn't allow their circumstances to cause them to compromise. I'm going to ask you this question. Do you allow the circumstances of your life to cause you to compromise? This week, just a little tidbit for me. I believe the church should be open. I was tried by fire. I had a tough day. The circumstance Monday and Tuesday really thought, should I shut, this, should I shut it down for two weeks? Because what does common sense tell us today, right? At least the CDC and WHO says, well, if you're exposed, two weeks. Now they're, now they're throwing new four, 24 days now for school. I mean, we're throwing darts. Is it, I heard 10 days. Then somebody said, well, if you don't show symptoms, it's three days. We don't know what it is, but we know 14 days is the magic word in our society. And you know what I decided to do? What I have stood on, what I have said, I want to be consistent. I'm not going to compromise. The church is going to remain open, and we're going to do the best we can, because if we don't watch it, we're going to open, close, open, close, open, close. How is that going to work for anybody's spiritual rhythm? People will go, forget it. I'm not coming back. So I won't back. Anyway, I mean, all of us have to deal with that. We all go through times where we have to say, wait a minute, I'm going to stand on the truth here, even though there's going to be a lot of peer pressure for me to say don't. I'm going to stand on God's word. I'm not going to compromise because of a circumstance. Verse 19, then Nebuchadnezzar was furious. These three they stood. The band played. Everybody around them bowed. They stood their ground. Whew. Boy, I wish, I wish we had that kind of faith. Nebuchadnezzar, though, was furious. His attitude toward them, the Bible says, changed. Leave it on that verse. Because you know what I love about this? I see it all the time. When we stand for what is right, people around us, their attitude changes. Some of you, you were far from Christ. You lived a crazy life. People around you loved you because you were crazy and you did what they did. And if they did something wrong, you did it with them. And so everybody felt okay. But you started to stand on, hey, I'm going to stand on faith. I want my conscience to be clear. I want to do the right things. What happens? People's attitude towards you changes really quickly. Today. 
If you're on the wrong side of somebody's political desire, oh, we're unfriending. Mm, did you defriend me? I mean, public health. If we, people, I mean, it's crazy how many people's attitude towards each other, even family members, change. Well, Nebuchadnezzar's attitude changed. He ordered the furnace, and this is what I find just fascinating. He ordered the furnace seven times hotter than usual. I don't know about you, but fire's pretty hot just from the get-go. But he's pretty ticked off. He orders the fire stoked so hot and commands some of his strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men wearing robes, trousers, turbans, clothes were bound, remember this, thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent, he's so ticked off, the furnace is so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who stood there and opened the door and pushed them in. And then it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, verse 23 is key. These three men, firmly tied, fell into a blazing furnace. So my question to all of us today is, what has you tied up right now? We used to talk about marriage and family relationships and maybe contemplating a move. Should I take this job? Now, what are the key words? Doubt, fear, overwhelmness, uncertainty. If we don't watch it, we're so tied down with fear that we don't even live life. I equate it to this, and this is good. This is original to me, but I think this is the way effectively our society is. Think of a big field. And the grass has grown like chest deep. And we're all walking through this field. And you can't really see the ground. And you're walking through this chest deep grass. And we're all in this together. And I think we're like ultimately now, we're all wondering, am I going to be the one to step on the rattlesnake? We're fighting this very invisible enemy. We don't know. And again, thank God for the great technology in our room. If there's red mist, then we all need to run. We'll clear the building. But right now, it seems really good. So we're okay. You know what's crazy? Some people go, is that for real? Is that real? I almost think our society today, and I saw it on Facebook, and it was one of the funniest things I've seen in a long time, that if the government told us to walk on all fours because COVID does not go from four feet down, I think you would have people, okay, I'm going in the express lane at Walmart. Some of you are like, why is he funny? I would do that. I mean, it's, what's got you tied up right now? If I don't watch it, just turning on the news ties me up. The Bible says sin easily entangles, but so does fear. So does worry. So how about this? Grasp God's hand when you walk through the fire. That's what God's word teaches us in Daniel chapter 3. Grasp God's hand. The Bible doesn't say cover to cover that you won't go through the fire. You will. I will go through the fire. But God will be with us through the fire if we grasp his hand. This is what it says, and this is pretty cool for me. Ready? Then King Nebuchadnezzar, because he's thrown these guys in the fire. The soldiers have died. He's looking. It's probably a big pit down there. He's looking around. It's hard to see through the smoke, but he, he says this. He says, King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet. It's almost like, I almost think like a gladiator moment, you know, where there, there's this pit, and Nebuchadnezzar's sitting on his throne, and there, he's supposed to hear guys like, ah, you know, screaming. And he's like, he leaps to his feet in amazement. And what does he say? He says, uh, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into that fire? And the people around them, of course, said, what? Everybody say it with me in your best royal voice. Certainly, your majesty. That was a really bad. And I think Nebuchadnezzar, you think we go crazy and you think we get insane. He was so insane. He was like, what is happening? I can't believe what I'm seeing. I almost think, forget Tom Petty. I think Jerry Lee Lewis went like, or Nebuchadnezzar went like Jerry Lee Lewis on the entire crowd. And I think he's just like, can these guys just die? And almost, can you hear? Can you hear? I can hear it. I can hear these lyrics right here, which I think is so good. You shake my crown and you're causing me shame. Your fire walking's driving me insane. Oh, what a thrill. You guys are for real. Goodness. Great. I mean, I can almost hear that. Some of you are like, Brent, I don't hear that at all. 
That's why y'all pay me 700,000 a year. That's why you love your pre. Oh, it got quiet quick. That was good. Here's what he said. Verse 25, he said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, four. And all four of them are unbound and unharmed. And that fourth guy, I, he looks like the son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar didn't quite get it all, but he got close. Most theologians, I believe this. You might believe it was an angel, God sending a guardian angel. What if God was one of I, I, I believe, I believe it was a pre-incarnated Jesus Christ who had come to the earth, even in the Old Testament that Christ made an appearance and it wasn't the son of God's, it was the son of God that walked in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. I'm gonna get to heaven and that's one of the first things I'm gonna check out. We used to say that was, remember with Blockbuster days, that's the first video I'll check out but now it's, I'm sure it'll be live streamed. I'm gonna get to heaven, I'm gonna find out who was in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and God's gonna look at me and go, you were right, you were right. Do you know why God allows fiery furnaces in our life? For two reasons, if you really think about it, and we don't like to think about it, for our good and for his glory. The church is too comfortable right now. It's been too comfortable for a long time. I'm kind of studying this, and I really think this to be real. Why is the church sitting this one out? Why is it in the world in which we live? People should be running to the church. Why are we all just so, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. I think because ultimately the last 30 years, the prevailing preaching has been, when you're a Christian, everything is good. But you understand, right? If you look at your spiritual growth chart, in God's economy, our low points are his high points. When we go, God, I have nowhere to go but to look to you. I will hold fast in the storm. God, if you don't show up, I'm going to throw up. God, when I am weak, you are strong. We don't grow on the mountaintop. We grow in the valley. And it's funny how throughout the world, persecuted Christians thrive the most. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they turn their world upside down literally because of their faith, because of holding fast. Verse 26, Nebuchadnezzar, then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, love this man. You know, this is a politician king for real right here. He goes, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the most high God, come on out here. Come on out, boys. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. Everybody crowded around them. They saw the fire had not harmed their bodies nor singed the hair on their head. Their robes, their robes were not scorched. How specific is God's word? How awesome is it? And there was no smell of fire on them. The last few months I've tried to get healthy eating so I've, I've, I've become a smoker. I have a pellet grill, a smoker, you know, a pellet grill. I like to smoke chicken and, and turkey. My son's, my favorite thing I smoke is turkey, but on bad days, brisket. Love brisket, but brisket is low and slow, right? It takes a long time to smoke a brisket. My, I think it takes me about 14 hours door to door. You know what I'm saying? And so what happens is I put it on overnight. I wake up at five in the morning like any good brisketeer. I'll wrap it in butcher paper. I won't really open the lid long. I'll, I'll open it, wrap it in a bunch of paper and put the lid down because if you're looking, you ain't cooking. You know, you know that deal. And so just for like 10 seconds, I'm wrapping it, putting the probe in it and I put the brisket back to bed and I go back to bed, it's five in the morning. I get in there and Giovanna's like, <laughs> you smell like smoke. And it is true, I wake up in the morning and I'm like, there's like a brisket in the bed. And that's just for a second. Can you imagine being thrown into a fire and you walk out and your clothes don't even smell like smoke? So Nebuchadnezzar had no choice, did he? Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, 
who sent his angel, I believe it was Jesus, and rescued his servants. They trusted him, defied the king's command, and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any God except their own God. Boy, do we need to live and understand and learn a lesson from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God's word is awesome. Hold fast. God, thank you for this opportunity to be here. As we close with this hymn that was written a long time ago, all of us together, it's true, sometimes it's struggle. We struggle, days are hard. We're afraid our faith will even fail. The world is a crazy place. So God, I'm so grateful that even the days that it's so hard for us to see, we're just gonna hold your hand by faith and you will hold us fast. You got us, you don't move. The question is, are we moving away from you or toward you? And today more than ever, that needs to be answered. In Jesus' name we pray.